Hey, what's up? Just want to thank you guys for watching our channel. Please hit that subscribe button. Brian, how did the Lakers get Reeves back at that number? We were talking about this the other day. Well, they signed him to the absolute max they could sign him to. Um, the word max is, is, is tough these days because there's the annual max, there's the max years, and then certain guys, when they get extensions, they can only go so high. And so it's like you can say that I signed a max contract, but it's really your max. So the most that the Lakers could sign Austin Reeves to was at four years and 56 million. In, unless, because of the CBA, there's always an unless. Um, you may remember years ago the way the Houston Rockets went and sort of pried Jeremy Lin out of New York. Um, this also happened with Tyler Johnson, but the Heat um, matched this. So the way it works is, um, I don't know, should I give the whole etymology uh, yes, go go all the way back from? to Please. Gilbert Arenas. Okay. Just do Please. it. Why not? Okay. Inform okay. the viewers. In 2001, Gilbert Arenas got drafted in the second round by the Golden State Warriors, who sucked. And they signed him to a two-year contract, which is what a lot of second-round picks would get signed to. And he was awesome. He absolutely kicked ass for two years. And he became a restricted free agent. And they could match the offer, any offer. But back then, if you only had two years of service time, you didn't have full bird rights. You only can pay anybody whatever if they're under a three contract. If they're under a two-year contract, you have what's known as early bird rights, so just limited. And so the Washington Wizards had a bunch of cap space. I think they paid him 10 or $11 million a year. Uh, the Warriors, even though he was restricted, just functionally could not match it. Um, even you know, And then the next year or the year after, Carlos Boozer with the Cavs, same boat. He was a restricted free agent. The Jazz offered him like $12 million a year. The Cavs couldn't functionally match it. So they put in a rule that if you were, if you had two years in the league and you were a restricted free agent, you could only get offered up to the average player salary, which it, nowadays is $12 million. So there's a, but there was a loophole in there. It only was for the first two years. And then after the first two years, that restriction gets lifted. So when Jeremy Lin, two years of service time with the Knicks, was an early bird free agent, here come the Houston Rockets. And they sign him to an offer sheet that was, I don't remember the numbers, but like it was like $7 million the first year, maybe $8 million the first year, $9 million the second year. Okay, that was the rules. And then in the third year, when the, what is known as the arenas provision was lifted. They could go all the way to the max. So the, the offer sheet looked like this, 7 million, 8 million, 21 million, 22 million. And the Knicks were like, wait a minute. You mean if we match this in two years, we're going to uh, have to pay Jeremy Lin $22 million. And so they didn't match. And it made, um, it made everybody in New York sick, but it was like, a poison pill contract. Um, a few years later, the Nets did it to Tyler Johnson from the Miami Heat. He had been really good, one of those non-drafted guys who they like polished up. And the Nets had like $80 million in cap space. And they're like, well, it wasn't that much, but they had millions and millions of cap space. It's like, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna put him to the test. And, and his contract was like six million, seven million, 18 million, 19 million. Like they backloaded it and the heat actually matched it. And there's a famous story that Tyler Johnson told the ESPN, the magazine, after he got the contract, he went into the bathroom and threw up because <laughs> even though he was getting this money, he like couldn't believe he was getting this type of contract. So fast forward to now, it was possible for a team like the Spurs or um, I don't know, a team like the Thunder, although I could never see them doing this, but a team like the Spurs, who had all this cap space and now you have to spend it like before you could save your cap space. And as long as you got to the salary floor by the end of the season, you were okay. And you could pick up somebody at the trade deadline or whatever. Now you have to have 90% of your salary cap space spent on opening night. Otherwise you face some penalty, which I don't even know what is. So it was possible that somebody could have liked Austin Reeves enough that they could have given this poison pill contract where it was 12 million the first year, 12, five or 13 million the second year. And then it leapt up to literally like 30 million. Um, so that didn't happen. So 
he didn't get the offer sheet. So the Lakers were able to give him basically a standard four year extension. Um, who knows? I'm not in the Spurs. I'm trying to think of the other teams I thought, like maybe the Magic. I'm not in one of those teams' front offices to say, oh, yeah, they got real serious. But it was always probable that the Lakers were going to be able to keep him. And um, it was unlikely, as good as Austin is, I don't think people in a in an environment where we are now want to have him on a $30 million contract in, in three years. So it was good for the Lakers that they were able to keep him on that number. But the concept that like Rob Palinka like did some sort of wizardry and sorcery, like, oh my gosh, we talked Austin Reeves into taking a discount. No, they literally paid him every dime they possibly could. They just avoided another team doing something, which I would have think would, would regard as stupid. Do you think, I don't know if how Austin Reeves marketplace fits into this comment I'm about to make. Do you think with the new CBA and the trend of pre-agency for most of the star players um, that by and large, something like LeBron James in 2010, of course, the anomaly of 2016 with Kevin Durant, but by and large, free agency for the highest level star players is effectively over. I mean, you look last year, I, I would probably say Jalen Brunson was the best free agent and not that Jalen Brunson was a, wasn't, isn't a star, but you know, g- coming off his Dallas campaign, like he, he wasn't a huge name this year, the two really big names, um, you know, I, I'll say this gently, but have some baggage, right. And, and ultimately James Harden opted in Kyrie ended up, you know, using some leverage to get back to Dallas, but it just seems like we're headed for a period where, Teams are just going to extend their best players over and over again, have the contract. We've seen so many times where players like Jalen Brunson get to free agency. The team needs him back, and they effectively lose him for nothing. Okay, let's go to 100,000 feet, not only 30,000 feet, 100,000 feet. The lockout that we had in 2011, we, as if I was in the union, the lockout that the NBA had in 2000 i had the lock i was locked you out did. i was you were locked, locked out. that f out that lockout was largely about uh control of the pie i would say it's about money but they're all about money but um at that time the players were making 57 percent when either uh, the entire revenue pie the players were making 57 percent and the reason they got to 57 percent was because the nba installed a luxury tax. Cause when the NBA installed a luxury tax, it was like nobody in their right mind is ever going to um, spend to that. Uh, it's going to be a hard cap and you're going to screw us. And they said, okay, well, what if we gave you 57%? It's laughable because now luxury tax is hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars in spending in the luxury tax every single year. But anyway, so that lockout was to get that number closer to 50, 50. And it worked. The, the owners won that lockout. Um, Somewhere, Billy Hunter will be angry. Maybe the players union will be angry. But when the dust settled, it was 51% for the players, 49% for the owners. They basically closed it down to all, to almost 50-50. The players can still claim a slight edge, but they collapsed it down. And that 6% difference has been worth billions of dollars and will be worth billions of dollars in the future. Once the owners got that 50%, over the last three CBAs, they have slowly but surely peeled back free agency rights. So the Supermax, um, which, which came in, which was a sort of a, a golden, golden is in the right world, diamond encrusted handcuffs um, to put on players. Um, and now like the second apron, which is in existence, which is, which is a, an anti super team building measure with each encroaching. And then, you know, they, you remember JJ, when you came in the league that you could get a seven year contract, then it was a six year contract. Now it's five and four years. Now a lot of players are getting one-year contracts guaranteed with non-guaranteed years in them. We are heading more towards football-style contracts. Uh, In fact, I would argue, you. what what year did you sign the one-year deal with Phil? 17. It was the year after 16. Yeah, yeah. But in 17 and I believe 18 as well, the average contract length in free agency was 1.7 years and 1.5 years. 
Right. So even now we are saying, like, if you look at what the Rockets are doing last year, they signed Kevin Porter to an extension where it was one year guaranteed. And I think three years, non-guaranteed or lightly guaranteed or whatever. Kevin Porter is only guaranteed. I believe this year on his, on his extension. When we see the dust settle on these deals that were also made by the Rockets this year, particularly like Jock Landale, where it came out as a four year, $32 million contract. Hey, maybe he plays all four years and gets all 32 million, but I believe that's one year guaranteed, three years non guaranteed. I know that everybody said that Dylan Brooks is four years full, 80 million guarantee, and maybe he will be, but I'm waiting for that one. I'm waiting to see on that one. And so, and like um, Zion's contract, and I know that that, that's related to his injuries. That's basically one year guaranteed. Maybe there's two years guaranteed, but it's mostly non guaranteed. Josh those Hart's are, contract with the Pelicans as well. That was that was one are, year guarantee, team option on the second year, and then a, essentially a mutual option on the third year. Right. These are basically all um, NFL style contracts. And why does the NFL give out contracts like that? Because they have a hard salary cap. And if they they pay a player and the player gets hurt, if they can't get out of the contract, it's, so over the years of the NFL, there's been the the signing bonus and they've used a way to manipulate that to make sure the guarantees go up. But basically the NBA is moving towards the NFL model. Now, if someone from the union heard say that they would absolutely come in here and give a strong rebuttal that I'm wrong. And I'm not necessarily saying that it's that simplistic. The other side of it is that the N- the NBA has gotten more included into the pie of revenue. So that pie of revenue is growing, that 51% is growing, and that by the end of this current CBA, the average player salary might be around $15 million. And that the the guys who are getting the Supermax are now touching 300 million. So let's not lay awake tonight and be worried about (laughs) the growth of NBA player salaries. But in terms of the structure of the rules and the limiting of free agency and super team building, those measures that is, after getting that pie closer to 50-50, that is what's been going on. And the reason that's been going on, JJ, as you know, is that the majority of the NBA is made up of small markets. Um, and uh, they have the voting power. And ultimately, as powerful as the Lakers are, as powerful as the Warriors are, just like as powerful as LeBron is, he's got one vote out of 450. The Lakers have one vote out of 30. You know, the, the Warriors and Lakers and Knicks and Nets can block vote, but they ain't out voting the Jazz and the and the and the you know the the Thunder and the Bucks and the Wolves and the Cavs and all that stuff. So it's been moving in that direction. I think that you're you're spot on, and that there there is a trend. It seems like th- there's more of a trend towards at least that last year of a contract either being partially or non guaranteed. Um, but that's existed for a while. I, I think the important thing to point out here, Brian, and and you you alluded to this, the players are going to get paid regardless. The players are guaranteed to get the fifty one percent. So in one in one way, shape, or form, that money is going to go into the players' pocket. As whether the that's salary right. cap rises or not, it's going to the players' pockets. How it gets to them and the way contracts are structured. Yeah, there's going to be some changes and there will continue to be these these trends of these non-guaranteed or, or partial guaranteed. I, I'm curious to get your perspective on winners and losers in free agency, because I think sometimes uh, it's not just about the big splash. Sometimes it can be about continuity. Bucks is a great example of that. Getting Lopez to come back, him not signing a massive offer sheet with a Houston or someone like that, getting Middleton back. Uh, my team for I, if you were look at like straight additions to the team and not just bringing guys back, I, I, I think Houston and, and the Cleveland Cavaliers were my two winners in free agency because of the additions they made to their roster, the new guys coming in. What about Phoenix outside of the trade? Yeah, so Phoenix, <clears throat> I like when I can see a strategy and you can see a strategy in the minimum players that they signed. They signed all guys who were long, and basically plus three point shooters, like, you know, over 35% three point shooters. Now, some of them don't shoot that much. Um, 
like uh, Drew Eubanks doesn't shoot like five a game. He shot like 20 for the season, but he's a guy who can, in theory, stretch the floor a little bit. Um, and all their guys they signed had long arms and had length and athleticism, with the exception of Eric Gordon, who isn't particularly long, but is a killer scorer and one of the best value minimum contracts. And they did something interesting. Most of the guys they signed to the minimum, they gave a second year player option to. And that seems boring, like it's just something you would read in a tweet and move on with your life. But if you sign a player to a to a um to a veteran's minimum, it's three million dollars now. How about that, JJ? You could probably go get three million. I guarantee you could get three million dollars this year. I guarantee you could. So just just you think about that. Three million dollars now. But it's three million dollars for a veteran's Brian, minimum. I, I I don't want to take a pay cut. <laughs> <laughs> Jack score. That was spectacular. Oh, brilliant. Well, think of the per diem. What's the per diem? Do you figure that in? Yeah. Well, I, you, right. you got you have to factor in the co- the benefits. You know, it's an extra year of uh, my HSA. It's an extra year of a 401k match. I get all that. I get all that. Uh, yeah. The health savings account's great for NBA players. All right. So anyway, <laughs> um, $3 million is for the minimum. If you sign a minimum player in the NBA, the NBA actually pays for the majority of that contract. The, like out of NBA money. Why? Why do they do that? Because when they did a CBA deal years ago and they were like, wait a minute, the veterans make a million and the rookies make 400 grand. These teams won't sign veterans. They'll sign a bunch of rookies. So they said, okay, here's what we'll do. You pay the same price for every minimum and then we'll pay the rest out of the TV money. So it's like, it's kind of how like the heat paid uh, Udonis Haslam back, you know, like Udonis Haslam, I took pay cuts all those years. And then for like six years, they let him, um, signed for the veterans minimum. And it was like, you know, one, five, one, eight, two, two, five. The league was paying for most of it. (laughs) The league was paying his money back. Don't tell anybody. Okay. (laughs) So, but if you give a two year contract, which a player option could be, it means that you don't get that money that, you know, that the, uh, the, the team pays the whole amount. So that means that I think they signed seven to seven minimums. And I think they gave five of them, four or five of them player options that cost Matt Ishbia something like eight or $9 million in extra salary for this year and potentially next year and corresponding tax. So they had a strategy of what type of players they were going to sign. You're going to sign long guys who can shoot a little bit. And that friend Frank Vogel now is going to go forth and design his defense and strategy, but I'm going to have, nine guys that I can play who have long arms and have athleticism and we can stretch the floor and everything like that. And they won battles for some of these guys who had two or three offers. Like, Hey, listen, we'll give you a player option so you can walk on us. But, and here's the other thing on a player option. You know, this JJ, if you have a player option on a minimum contract means you can't be traded without your permission. Functionally, Eric Gordon has a no trade clause. So if the Suns come to a midseason and say, hey, we want to trade you to the to the Charlotte Hornets for so-and-so, he'd be like, nope. So like if you're trying to weigh like where you're going to go, and you're like, well, wait a minute. I can go play in Phoenix for a title in good weather with 2% state income tax. So you could have gone to Phoenix, JJ, you pay a lot less than you do in New York. And I can block a trade. It's getting better all the it's time. Good, good golf, too. And I can block a trade. Yeah, I can golf, golf year-round, too. Golf in January, JJ. I mean, I think they got a roster spot left. How's your? What's your wingspan? Negative. Um, it's negative. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I it was I was, like I don't know if the sun like when you sign minimum contracts. Sometimes they're great. Sometimes they're not great. They're minimums for a reason. So like these guys could all end up not being good. Like Eric Gordon could be gassed, but I could see the strategy what they were doing, and it made sense to me, and I respected it. 